Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Perspectives in FTD Research webinar, Brain Donations, Who, What, Where, When, and Why. This webinar is being presented jointly by the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration and the FTD Disorders Registry. My name is Dr. Shana Dodge, and I'm AFTD's Director of Research Engagement. On behalf of everyone here, thank you for joining us. A few housekeeping items before we get started. Please note that our audience will be muted for the duration of this webinar in order to keep background noise to a minimum. If you have any technical issues, please write a message in the questions box and we will try to address them. Time permitting, we will have a brief Q&A at the end of the presentation. If you have a question about brain donation, type it into the questions box when you think of it. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to submit your question. We have a lot planned for this webinar, however, so if we don't have time to answer questions, you can always reach out to AFTD's helpline at 866-507-7222 or info at theaftd.org. Note that this webinar will be recorded and, and archived for later viewing on both AFTD's YouTube page and the FTD Dis Disorder Registry's YouTube page. This Perspectives in Research webinar is made possible through the support of Elector. Thank you to the folks at Elector for their generous sponsorship of our work. Next, I'd like to highlight the FTD Disorders Registry. The registry is a powerful tool in the movement to discover treatments and a cure for FTD. It relies on the stories of people like you, persons diagnosed with FTD, current and former caregivers, family members, and friends. Your stories and experiences will help to spur innovation that will lead to effective treatments and therapies. If FTD has touched your life in some way, I strongly encourage you to join the thousands of people who have already signed up for the registry. Registration allows you to receive periodic news and FTD research updates by email, as well as notifications to participate in surveys and research studies to help further the science of FTD. The next AFTD Education Conference will be held May 5th in downtown St. Louis. This annual event brings together persons affected by FTD, experts in the field, and healthcare, professional, healthcare professionals for a full day of learning and connection. For those who can't make it to St. Louis, it will be available online with our free live stream. For those of you planning to attend or considering attending in person, we will have additional sessions only available in St. Louis, including a networking opportunity for people diagnosed with FTD, a mindfulness session for FTD care partners, and a pre-meeting session for people with genetic FTD. You can visit AFTD's website for more information about these pre-meeting in-person sessions and the rest of the conference program. And also keep an eye on your email inboxes for more information. This year's keynote speaker will be Dr. Bruce Miller from UCSF. Visit AFTD's website today to learn more about the program and to register for the in-person event or the live stream. I would now like to introduce our two main presenters today. David Irwin, MD, is the principal investigator of the Penn Digital Neuropathology Lab and an attending cognitive neurologist in the Penn Frontotemporal Degeneration Center. His research focuses on integrating histopathology and imaging methods in the human brain to develop and validate biomarkers based on gold standard histopathology, with the overall goal of improving diagnosis to facilitate clinical trials for emerging therapies for FTD and associated neurodegener neurodegenerative disorders. Lauren Massimo, PhD, CRNP, is an assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania in the School of Nursing and the School of Medicine Frontotemporal Degeneration Center. Dr. Massimo's research program focuses on identifying the cognitive and neural basis for symptoms of neurodegenerative disease. Dr. Massimo will be speaking with Sandy Carger, who was the caregiver for her husband, Bob. Bob had FTD for 14 years and died in 2021. Shortly after his diagnosis, Bob and Sandy decided to donate his brain for research after his death. We will also be joined by representatives from All FTD, the Brain Donor Project, and the Brain Support Network for further insights on the brain donation process. And now I will turn things over to Dr. Irwin. 
Thank you, Shana, and thank you to the AFTD and the organizers, and thank you to everyone today for joining me this afternoon. Um, we'll start the webinar with a brief presentation on brain donations, who, what, where, when, and why. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, these are my disclosures, and uh, next slide, please. We'll go over the outline of the talk. So uh, the first thing we'll be talking about is uh, the factors that go into making the decision about brain autopsy. And we'll be focusing first on the clinical benefit as well as uh, benefit to patients and families in terms of uh, understanding the, the ultimate diagnosis of the disorder. Uh, and then in the second part of the talk, we'll be talking more about the research aspect of brain donation and how incredibly powerful um, brain donation, the impact that it makes towards uh, getting better diagnostics and ultimately treatments for FTD and related disorders. And then uh, finally, at the end, uh, some more logistical uh, topics about what to expect going through the process to enroll in a brain donation program and uh, what are the, uh, the outcomes of, of that. Uh, next slide, please. So first, I think it's helpful to start with some definitions uh, that can be confusing, uh, particularly the difference between brain autopsy and brain donation. And these two terms aren't completely mutually exclusive. So brain autopsy is a clinical uh, procedure, meaning it's uh, done for clinical care. Uh, it's a neuropathological examination of the brain that obtains a final diagnosis of the biological cause of dementia. Um, this can be done through most healthcare centers uh, at a hospital that a patient has been treated by. Brain donation is slightly different. Um, brain donation is done uh, for research, and that is a crucial contribution to accelerate diagnostics and treatments. The diagnosis itself of what the neuropathology is that causes a patient's symptoms can be extremely valuable for research, as well as study of the tissue. And um, in most brain donation programs, there is a clinical report of what the neuropathologist uh, finds as a diagnosis and that's shared with the family. So one could participate in a research brain donation and get the clinical benefit of the neuropathological report from the pathologist at, at, um, as well. Uh, next slide, please. So as a, a neurologist a clinician who sees patients with uh, frontotemporal degeneration, I've been trained uh, to take a careful history and a detailed elemental exam of the neurologic exam, checking reflexes and strengths, and also cognitive exam. And what you see here are different uh, aspects of cognition and motor functioning that we can objectively measure in clinic. And these tell us about relative areas of the brain that may be having difficulty, and these contribute to networks that uh, connect these different parts of the brain. Uh, next slide, please. And when we see certain uh, constellation of symptoms, we put them together into diagnoses. And you can see here in different colors, the main clinical diagnoses that relate to frontotemporal degeneration, the behavioral variant in green that relates to frontal and temporal regions involved with executive function and behavior, um, primary progressive aphasia variants, the non-fluent variant in red, the semantic variant in brown, which relate to frontal and temporal disease more in the left hemisphere, respectively. Um, cortical basal syndrome, which is often lateralized to one hemisphere and involves frontal and parietal regions as well as brainstem regions in, in orange. Progressive supranuclear palsy syndrome that can involve frontal regions and especially in the motor areas and subcortical regions as well in yellow. And finally, ALS, which we think of as a primary motor neuron disease, uh, but can also uh, contribute to these other cognitive syndromes. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but what is striking is that the clinical diagnosis doesn't always tell us what is the cause of the disease. So um, you could see again the main syndromes that we talked about on the bottom and they're um, listed here. And if we advance one slide, please, uh, we could see the, pers the perspective of the neuropathologist who uh, looks at the uh, slides of the brain under the microscope. And what you see is in each of those syndromes, the boxes are color-coded by the relative frequencies of different pathologies we see under the microscope. And if we can advance one slide, please, you could see an example of this. Um, and what we find associated with frontotemporal degeneration is 
roughly equal numbers of patients having the protein tau accumulated that you can see on the left in red lettering or the protein TDP43. These are very different proteins that we all have in our brains that for reasons we're not fully aware of, uh, but as intensely studying is they misfold and cause brain cells to have difficulty. And you could see a brick wall depicted here because clinicians who see patients and neuropathologists who examine brain tissue, we have different na uh, names for diseases because the syndromes of the behavioral variant or primary progressive aphasia, while very important for diagnosis and understanding symptoms, don't tell us about the biology. And we need to start speaking the same language. So if we observe, uh, advance one more slide, please. Um, we need to remove this barrier and advance again, please. Uh, and by doing that, we need markers or biological tests or biomarkers that reflect the pathology. And a good um, parallel to this situation is cancer research where and clinical treatment, where a piece of tissue in the lung or the liver is easily accessible with a biopsy. And then we know exactly what type of tumor it is and treatments are being tailored for those specific tumors with the brain, we can't easily get a biopsy safely, so we need to develop other methods by looking at blood, imaging, spinal fluid, and so forth. Uh, next slide, please. That's where brain donation comes in is so important for those efforts. So how does a brain autopsy or getting a clinical or uh, neuropathological diagnosis help, um, help your family? One, it, it's a final diagnosis we get uh, as many on the call have experienced, um, I'm sure, challenges in getting a diagnosis because of the nature of FTD being a slowly progressive disease and uh, could take a few years to manifest and be clearly diagnosed. By getting a final diagnosis, we understand what is the biological or microscopic cause uh, of those symptoms. And that could be um, important for closure and important to understand um, risk for uh, the family. The majority of FTD is a sporadic disease, but the rate of familial disease that could be caused by a pathogenic mutation in, in most studies about 15 to 20 percent. And by understanding the pathology that's found in the brain in a family member could help inform uh, genetic risk for the rest of the family. It's important to note that genetic information itself is usually not included in a pathology report that will require separate evaluation um, during life uh, with a genetics counselor, and that's a very important aspect of uh, clinical care. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, now moving on to the research aspect of brain donation. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is a very important for us to advance the science. So um, neuropathological diagnosis informs the clinical data collected during life. So when we do uh, research studies to study FTD, um, having a pathology diagnosis enhances all the data that's collected during life. Um, that helps us link measures of cognition, MRI measurements, blood, spinal fluid, uh, many things that patients who enroll in all FTD and, and other research studies um, helps us understand the link with these specific pathologies that cause FTD. And not only just the diagnosis, but the tissue itself is so critical to develop new diagnostics and treatments. Scientists who study mechanisms of how neurons survive and what uh, causes these protein accumulations to cause the disease, having access to tissue is critical to under identify and develop new treatments that can stop that process. So it's an incredibly meaningful uh, contribution to science. Next slide, please. And to illustrate this uh, is a process that we do at the Penn Frontotemporal Degeneration Center, where we do uh, both clinical trials and also observational research. And what's illustrated here is that we do longitudinal natural history studies where we systematically collect data. Uh, we try to share with patients as much as we can and what we learn about the biology with the studies that we have during life. And for those interested in brain donation, that gives us that critical information of what the pathological cause of the symptoms were. And um, uh, in the lab, we're able to then measure that pathology and relate it back to the data we collected. So we're refining our clinical diagnoses and we're developing new tools to improve our diagnosis in a living patient uh, and uh, illustrating the power of brain donation to accelerate discoveries. Next slide, please. 
Another way to illustrate this is for an example, that you see two MRIs obtained during life in patients that have disease in the temporal lobe in the red box. And it, uh, patients clinically had the same syndrome of behavioral variant FTD. They had atrophy on MRI that helps to the diagnosis of behavioral variant FTD. But then when you could see in the bigger box, these are uh, post-mortem MRIs at ultra high resolution where we get microscopic resolution and you can see very different patterns. So if we can improve our MRI scans, for example, and be able to look at a cellular level in a living patient, we might be able to tell what these two patients had very different pathologies. We'd be able to tell them apart during life. The patient on the left had Pick's disease with a very different pattern than we see with TDP43 on the right. And those patients could go to different clinical trials that would be targeting the different mechanisms involved in those very different pathological diseases. So this is an example of the work that we do at Penn that is uh, couldn't be done without um, the extremely meaningful uh, donation of, of brain donation at our center. Uh, next slide, please. So what to expect in some logistical uh, topics. Uh, we can advance next slide, please. Um, enrolling brain donation, it's important to um, ask your clinical team about autopsy. So in terms of obtaining a clinical neuropathological report for a final diagnosis, most uh, academic centers have autopsy programs where patients who are uh, treated clinically have access to autopsy. Um, and if you'd like to participate in brain donation, uh, enrolling in a clinical research program is one way to do that. And uh, we'll be hearing later about all FTD, a wonderful uh, large-scale program that helps facilitate brain donation for science uh, to advance uh, FTD care. Um, there's also nonprofit brain donation programs that we'll hear from later today, including the Brain Donor Project that's linked to the NIH, as well as the Brain Support Network uh, that has links to all FTD. Um, brain donation can be a sensitive issue and it can involve a discussion of the whole family, uh, including the patient. So having discussions early in the disease process are important, not only to make sure that everyone is comfortable with the decision, but also to help coordinate the logistics well in advance. Next slide, please. Um, some other logistical aspects of what to expect. Um, the consenting process for autopsy in most states is from the next of kin obtained after the time of expiration of the patient. So uh, most programs have some information packets and some preliminary uh, indicating interest in autopsy, but these aren't binding. It's the, uh, the final consent is only obtained from the next of kin after the patient expires. Um, most brain donation programs have contact information that, um, again, so by planning early, you can have this information handy for uh, it's near the time of death or at the time of death to call to help coordinate. Uh, most research programs cover the transportation um, to and from the academic center and to funeral homes. And most brain donation programs are, are done in methods that are compatible with most funeral practices without cosmetic uh, um, issues. Um, Neuropathologist report, a final written report is um, generated that can take a few months to, to obtain because um, the processing of the tissue and the careful review from a neuropathologist to formulate a final diagnosis can, uh, can take a few months. So it's important to stay in touch with the center and the, those are usually re uh, directly released to the next of kin and um, are reviewed by the treating clinician or a neurologist or other healthcare professional that saw the patient during life. Um, most research programs for brain donation offer different updates on uh, what's learned from brain donation. So at Penn, we have patient and family conferences that we held twice a year to help share what we're learning from all the work that patients and families do to do uh, research with us. Next slide. So I wanna end now to highlight some resources that we'll make available from uh, the Penn Frontotemporal Degeneration Center and access to some of our previous patient outreach events, uh, the videos and useful materials, as well as highlight uh, resources from the other speakers you'll hear from this afternoon, including the All FTD Research Network, the AFTD Brain Donation Project and Brain Support Network. 
So thank you very much again for uh, having me today, and I look forward to the rest of the program. Thank you, Dr. Irwin. Now we will hear from Dr. Leah Forsberg. Dr. Forsberg is an assistant professor of neurology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and serves as one of the program managers for the All FTD study. Dr. Forsberg, welcome. Thank you so much. And I just got the invite to share my screen. So just get, bear with me. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. I'm gonna go with yes. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Shana, and for, uh, thank you for being here. I'm um, one of the program managers for All FTD, as she, as she mentioned. If you're new to the FTD research space, All FTD stands for Artful Lefties Longitudinal Frontotemporal Lobar Degeneration, All FTD Research Study. Since it's an, a mouthful, we just use All FTD typically. Um, All FTD is an observational research study which began in fall 2019. We are jointly funded by the NIA and NINDS. The LFTD study is actually a formal merging of two previous FTD research programs. Um, sorry, just switched my screen. Um, two FTD research programs, the Artful Study and the Lefty Study. You can read what those acronyms stand for there. Um, the all of TD study as an observational study it does not involve a therapy, and instead, you know, we follow individuals who are participating on an annual basis collect a lot of um, tests and procedures so we can better understand how um, FTD progresses and hopefully learn a little more about FTD onset. As such, you know, we aim to do those things by evaluating sporadic and familial FTLD participants. In addition, we also um, evaluate asymptomatic family members of our FTLD participants and um, we characterize those two groups uh, longitudinally, as I mentioned, and our hope is really that what we're learning uh, will inform clinical trial design. We have 26 sites across the United States. You can go to our website to learn more, especially um, specific contacts for each of those sites. And we are hoping um, to add one more site uh, to the New York City area, so stay tuned. What's involved in an all FTD visit? So, um, Dr. Irwin, you know, mentioned biomarkers. It's a really hot topic. It's really important, and we collect a large variety in all FTD. And as such, our visits are kind of long. They're about two to three days in length usually, and they happen annually. So we, um, each visit has a clinical exam with a neurologist. There's neuropsychological testing, which is a, those memory and thinking tests, questionnaires with a study team member, a blood draw, an MRI. Um, if you're interested, we, uh, we allow or encourage people to do a lumbar puncture. We also offer clinical genetic counseling and testing for those that want to learn more about their genetics. Um, and then, of course, brain donation, why we are all here today. We also, you know, if you have, if you know someone participating in all of TD, you may be aware that we also have another visit, which is a lot shorter. It's usually a day or less. It only happens once. Um, and it focuses on collecting biospecimens, so specifically blood and cerebral spinal fluid. The majority of our participants, probably over 90%, are um, involved and enrolled in the, in the bigger annual study, which um, is mentioned above. So brain donation. Brain donation, obviously, is a very key component of um, understanding FTD and therefore all FTD, and so we offer it for those who are interested. And as Dr. Irwin mentioned, it's really kind of the final piece of the puzzle. Uh, we've been collecting so much information on everybody that participates in all FTD, and we really get the final piece of the picture um, upon uh, somebody's passing and, and brain if brain donation is, is part of their plan. If you're interested or if those participants are interested, we encourage pre-planning as much as possible. And then uh, one of the benefits of being in all FTD and research is generally the costs associated with brain donation are covered. One important thing to note, if you remember our site slide, there's a lot of sites all over the country in very different types of environments. Most sites follow a very similar process as it relates to you know, brain donation and all of our procedures, but each site is a little different. So if you know someone at another site and they are sharing something about their experience and it's different than yours, don't be worried. It's probably um, just the way, the nature of, of the beast. What is brain donation pre-planning? Um, 
we really strongly encourage pre-planning whenever possible, and I'm sure you'll hear about this from additional speakers, but for us, pre-planning really helps take a time in your life or your family's lives that is very stressful and full of a lot of different processes and things you need to get done and hopefully eliminates one of those stresses, which is how do you coordinate a brain donation? So the first step that we always encourage is to discuss your wishes with your family, your loved ones, people involved in your care. Um, the next step would be to sign an advance directive. We encourage you to keep a copy of your records. This is just an official form that says you wanna proceed with brain donation. Involved in this is mentioning the next step kin who will actually sign it again upon um, the person's passing. So really important to keep everybody in the loop, especially if you're using um, or working with individuals or agencies um, like care staff, residential care staff, or hospice. Their next step after signing your advance directive is to select a funeral home and make sure they're aware of your desire to donate your brain. You'll then connect your OLFTD team or a different research team if you're working with someone outside of OLFTD and the funeral home and together they'll identify a pathologist and the three groups will work together to really coordinate donation logistics. What happens after brain donation? So as Dr. Irwin mentioned, um, you usually get some sort of clinical report that is consistent in all FTD, you will receive an official autopsy report. This can sometimes take months. And I know that that is a really complicated and emotional process for families and you know everybody's working their best to get it sooner, but it can take quite a bit of time. Um, and, and then in research, what makes it a little bit different is in addition to that official report, there's also a series of research related forms um, that is all taken care of on the back end by your all FTD team and the pathologist and those involved um, with the brain donation itself. Lastly, I'll just finish quickly and say um, this is a huge effort and takes a massive team. And you know, most importantly, we're really grateful to our participants and family members because without them, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. So thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Forsberg. Um, now we'll have a presentation from Tish Hevel, founder and CEO of the Brain Donor Project. The Brain Donor Project supports the National Institutes of Health's Neurobiobank in its mission to make high quality brain tissue samples available to neuroscientists. Welcome, Ms. Hevel. Thanks, Shanna. I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, everyone, for taking the time to learn about this. I'm going to share my screen, if I may. Put it back here. Okay, back to the beginning. Sorry about that, hang with me. Okay, the most important thing I need to tell you about brain donation is that not enough people know about it, which is an issue. Um, or they believe one of the misconceptions about brain donation, and these are the top five that we hear all the time. Um, a lot of people think if they check the box on their driver's license to be an organ donor, that that includes brain donation. It does not. Separate arrangements need to be made for it. Or they think if body, if they've signed up to be a body donor, it's the same thing, and it isn't. Uh, body donation is generally used for anatomic study, and the brain is much more valuable for neuroscience research. A lot of people think that only diseased brains are needed, and that's not true as well. And I, I love to be able to tell people who are interested in a particular disease that this is a way that their family and friends can also help support neuroscience by donating their so-called unaffected control brains. So we need those as well. It is also not disfiguring and when donating to one of the brain banks of the NIH, um, there is no additional cost to the family. So these are important points that that everybody needs to know. I should also let you know that it used to be a whole lot more complicated um, as we learned when donating my dad's brain, uh, which is why we started the Brain Donor Project to support the brain banks of the National Institutes of Health. This slide shows you a little bit of what our relationship is about. We exclusively support the brain banks in this network. They are located at Mount Sinai in New York um, at the University of Maryland, at Harvard, University of Miami, and um, the University of oh, UCLA. So while there's not a, a million sites like there are for um, all FTD, um, these brain banks are able to handle the entire country and have even collected from remote Alaska. 
So what's interesting about the neurobiobank that's different is that it is the nation's only federated network of brain banks. And it was developed just nine years or so ago to help researchers get access to the tissue. Um, there had been some barriers to access that were in place and the, it became clear that in order to advance science, the tissue needed to be much more available to people who need it. So the resources of the Neurobiobank are available to scientists all over the world in academia and industry. At the moment, there are more than 15,000 brains coming up on 16,000, I think, um, within the collection. And it's an incredible resource to science. If you'd like to know more, you could go to neurobiobank.nih.gov. Uh, the website is really tremendous for scientists. There's kind of two parts. If you go there, part of it says, oh, are you here because you'd like to be a brain donor? That's great, we need you really bad. And then it links to the brain donor project to start the process. But for scientists, they are able to log on, give the details of their study, um, and then consider the supplies that are available to them. They make a request, they get an answer within a couple of business days, and they just pay shipping. So it's, it's a tremendous way for scientists to get their hands on the tissue that they really need. Um, so what we did to, to jump into the science of supporting science is we created a website to help everybody understand why this is so critically needed. And once people get there, get their questions answered, then it's pretty simple to pre-register. There's a button in the upper right-hand corner that says brain pre-registration. And from there, it's a pretty brief online form. Once you decide or if you're making plans for yourself or someone else, the rest of it is um, mainly contact information and then room for a diagnosis um, if there is one. And we take that information and we work to connect that person to the appropriate brain bank in the neurobiobanks network. Um, so, um, how do, and then we let people know that um, they've just done a really great thing. So we've already talked a little bit, thanks to Dr. Irwin and Dr. Fosberg about how it works upon death. It's pretty much the same thing. Family member notifies, um, and then the brain bank makes the rest of the arrangements. They arrange to transport the body. Um, generally, the procedure is done at a funeral home. Brain bank sends a pathologist or recovery expert there to remove the brain, and they ship it to the brain bank, and then the body is released to the family for funeral and cremation. We also provide the neuropath report at no charge that you've heard so much about already today. So just to let you know who is pre-registering with the Brain Donor Project, um, since our inception a little over six years ago, coming up on six and a half, uh, it is nearly 18,000 people. About 40% of them are the unaffected controls we talked about, which is great because that tissue is needed in every single study for comparative science all ages, all states, and they represent more than 200 categories of neuro disorders. Um, we work a lot with patient advocacy groups of all kinds and a lot of experts that um, help people with end of life planning, nurses and those. Every once in a while, we're fortunate enough to get some real mainstream ink. Um, and in 2018, we were in National Geographic, which led to a huge surge of pre-registrations. And last year, we were on Science Friday on NPR um, on 400 radio stations across the country. And that also led to a huge surge. I'm going to ask you to keep your ears open for National Brain Donation Awareness Day, which was just announced last year. It's May 7th happens to be my dad's birthday. So we'll be making noise about that this year as well. Um, and then in closing, um, I, I try to tell all audiences, please consider brain donation. If it's something that, that you decide you want to do, and we hope it is, register in advance. Um, it can be done on the fly sometimes, um, but it's so much simpler to perform if you register in advance. Tell your family about your wishes because they are critical um, in the process as they're the ones that need to notify people about your death. And I always have to tell people we, we, we spend a lot of time uh, thinking about 
our stuff at the end of life, our money, our things, where we're going to put them, who gets what. Um, but it, to a lot of people, this tissue is the most precious gift you could give. And if you consider donating it, um, it really has a big impact in um, the future of science. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hevel. Um, our next presenter is Robin Riddle. Robin learned firsthand about FTD when her late father was diagnosed in 2004. With the help of other caregivers, she founded the nonprofit Brain Support Network, which, which has been responsible for more than 1,400 brain donations in the last 20 years. Now, here's, here's Robin with a short pre-recorded presentation. Thanks very much for the introduction. We've been partnering with the AFTD for almost two decades, and I previously spoke about brain donation at one of the national conferences. So it's a pleasure to update you today about our approach to FTD brain donation. Since our founding in 2004, Brain Support Network has focused on FTD and its many lookalike conditions. Previous speakers mentioned the major NIH-funded effort called All FTD. We are the only brain donation nonprofit that is an official part of this study. What that means is upon request, we assist any of the 19 study sites. For example, we might help Northwestern with a brain donation in Dallas, since that's a geography they aren't familiar with. But what if your family member isn't being seen at Penn's FTD Center or one of the other all FTD study sites? That's where Brain Support Network comes in. We can help with customized brain donation arrangements for your family. Specifically, we can help you donate your brain or your family member's brain to the Mayo Clinic, which is co-leading the all FTD study effort. The Mayo Clinic accepts any FTD brain donation. You don't have to have been seen at their clinic. Not all brain banks are the same. When you donate your brain, you don't want it to sit on a shelf. The best brain bank is one that is actively contributing to research for the disorder that you care about. In fact, Mayo was the discoverer of the c 9 orf genetic mutation associated with FTD. It also discovered hippocampal sparing Alzheimer's disease. Very often when we think someone has primary progressive aphasia like Bruce Willis, the brain donation report comes back as this type of Alzheimer's. Mayo actively publishes on all types of FTD. It co-authored a major PSP genetic study a few years ago that utilized donated brain tissue Researchers want to partner with Mayo to gain access to all of that donated FTD brain tissue. Dr. Irwin mentioned neuropathology reports, and the Mayo Clinic provides these reports to, to families within 100 days, which is very fast, faster than most other brain banks. Brain Support Network can help explain the autopsy findings to your family. We should note that half the time, the confirmed pathologic diagnosis is different from the clinical diagnosis during life. So these reports often contain surprises to families. So those are some of the great things about Mayo, but Mayo doesn't have coordinators who work seven days a week, and it doesn't have staff of seven people who can make comprehensive, customized, advanced arrangements corralling the many parties that need to be involved. And it has no staff to monitor the brain donation at the time of a donor's passing. Again, that's where Brain Support Network comes in. Your family can make an initial inquiry to Brain Support Network by completing one of our easy online forms, usually the soon form, if end of life is months or in fact years away. We also have an immediate need form. And even if end of life has already occurred, please contact us urgently as we do try to help everyone. The online form asks about the funeral home or cremation organization that you've selected and whether the person is on hospice. If your family member is on hospice, you should be making brain donation arrangements right now. The easiest place to perform the brain donation work is the funeral home. 
That's because other facilities like university medical centers don't usually do this work and their pathologists aren't available evenings, weekends, or holidays. So we contact the funeral home that you've selected to learn if they will allow this work to take place on site seven days a week. If the funeral home isn't cooperative, we usually have a workaround. Many families who contact us haven't yet selected a funeral home. That's because they're planning far in advance or like most of us, don't wanna think about end of life. We often have suggestions for you of funeral homes because we've called many thousands of them. Then we locate a pathology provider in your geographic area, ideally someone who is available seven days a week. This is because the brain must be recovered within 24 hours of death. We actually try to recover the brain within eight hours because faster is always better for researchers. Shortly after you submit that online form, we update you as to the costs involved. On average, the cost is $1,000. But fortunately, FTD families are eligible for a $1,000 reimbursement grant through another nonprofit organization. Brain Support Network asks every family we help to make a $500 charitable contribution or request memorial donations in lieu of flowers to come to us. Of course, many families do both. For every $500 donated, we are able to help another family with brain donation arrangements in this pay it forward manner. So once we know who's doing what, when, where, and for how much, we can then customize the consent paperwork for your family. After that comes medical records. Mayo now requires neurological records in advance of the brain donation, but unlike other brain banks, Mayo does not require five years of medical records. In many cases, Brain Support Network is able to help you download or order these records on your behalf. We then prepare detailed instructions for all the parties involved helping in the brain donation effort. Once the consent paperwork is complete, the neurological records are at the brain bank, and those detailed instructions are shared with all parties, you can have peace of mind that everything will proceed according to your wishes. Again, if everything is urgent, if the situation is urgent, all of these efforts get compressed into just a few hours. Brain Support Network staff is available seven days a week by email, text, or phone. We've helped over 1,400 families donate a loved one's brain. My father's brain was the first case I ever made arrangements for. His diagnosis of an FTD disorder was confirmed through brain donation to, you guessed it, the Mayo Clinic. Brain donation isn't just for those with FTD. For all listeners out there who have reason to believe that you are neurologically normal at the present time, <laughs> your brains are of interest to researchers too. It's best to contact Brain Support Network now so that we can make arrangements in a less stressful circumstance and obtain that peace of mind for you in knowing that everything is in place. Thanks for your help in advancing research into FTD, and we look forward to helping your family. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Riddle. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Lauren Mosmo of the University of Pennsylvania and former FTD caregiver, Sandy Carger. Great, thanks so much. Um, I'm so honored to introduce Sandy Carger, whose husband, Bob, had frontotemporal degeneration. Sandy and Bob were high school sweethearts and then miraculously um, reconnected after not being in touch for 40 years. They eventually got married and then several years later, Bob developed frontotemporal degeneration. Sandy and Bob made the generous decision to participate in the brain donation program at the University of Pennsylvania Frontotemporal Degeneration Center. Sandy feels strongly about the importance of support and education for FTD caregivers and she is the co-facilitator of an FTD support group that meets in Wynwood, PA. So Sandy has graciously agreed to share her experience of the brain donation process with us. So Sandy, can you um, first think back to when you began to consider brain donation and how was it initially discussed with you? 
Um, thanks, Lauren. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here and be with all of you. Uh, we thought about it very early on, and I was trying to remember the other day, I would say probably on our third or fourth visit, um, the physician approached us with the opportunity to donate Bob's brain at the time of his death. And he was very clear about what it meant, about what the process would be. And it actually helped me, and I think both of us, to kind of step a little bit further into the reality of what was happening and what was going to be. Um, so it empowered us to make the decision that we did. That's great. Thank you, Sandy. And and how did you discuss the brain donation with Bob? So Bob was experiencing some cognitive difficulties at the time. How how did you discuss it um, as as a couple? Um, and again, it, this is an opportunity to say I can't emphasize enough the importance of doing this early on because things change sometimes rapidly and it's just so important to be able now even in hindsight to look back and know that we had a chance to really discuss this but um we talked about it and, and i asked bob what what he felt and what he thought about his brain and and how we felt about what that would be like after his death and at first he was very positive about the whole experience and and wanted to donate his brain and then then as we got into a deeper discussion about it, um, his FTD uh, kind of mindset took over a little bit. And he said, he always talked about going up when he went up. And he said, well, I might need my brain up there. Um, so he pondered that a while. And I said, well, you know, why don't you think about that? Give it a few days, think about it. So he did. And, and then he came back and we discussed it again. And he said, you know, he said, when I go up, when I go up there, it's not going to matter. And if it does matter, they'll fix it. And maybe because I donated my brain, they'll be able to fix other people's brains too. So that was sort of where he was and, and he was a very positive person. So he um, he sort of came around and, and was very, very positive. And we, we chose or he chose uh, because it was a second marriage and we have two sets of children and he decided to just keep that decision between the two of us. It would have complicated things, I think, but there are, other situations where it might have been appropriate. So we did not discuss it, but we just discussed it together. I see. And so did uh, other members of the family, did they come to find out that Bob um, wanted, that we, he wished to donate his brain? Yes. And, and, and if so, how did they feel about it? Or how did you explain to other members of the family who um, may or may not have been on board with that decision? Yeah. Um, we and at that point i i explained it to them and bob was certainly there with me but um they were very accepting of it asked a few questions but realized i think the bottom line was this was his desire and these were hers his wishes and this is what he wanted and they were very supportive of it and also i think at the end when we had the report it was very um it was very good for them to be able to see the reality because there were some members that were in total denial the whole time. So once they could see this in black and white on paper, I think it helped them too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about um, why the brain donation was important to you and Bob? You mentioned, you know, doing good for other people um, and Bob was certainly um, a very generous person. Could you talk a little bit about other um, other things that you thought about that you know were really important, and per, you know um, perhaps maybe you thought this is something that we should do. Well, he, as you said, Lauren, he was a very generous person, and he was kind of the ultimate giver. He was the person who, if he saw a tiny child and had a cookie, he would give it to the child the strange child on the street that was his personality um but we really felt deeply that this was something that we had an opportunity to share and that it would be important going forward for who knows how many people if it was one person it didn't matter but we just felt and he felt very strongly about that that this was an opportunity to give and to help further the research into this very complicated disease. 
And it also, um, it added, one can say a meaning to such a, a difficult situation. It certainly did give some purpose and some meaning to what he was going through. Sandy, what did you do um, in advance to prepare for the brain donation itself? For example, did you have paper? Some have mentioned that paperwork um, may need to be completed. Uh, did you have to alert other medical teams, such as hospice teams, the funeral director? Can you talk a little bit about the preparation in advance? Yes, and that, that was also a very important piece of this, what I called process. Um, there was some paperwork and the paperwork that we had to do was certainly not overwhelming. It was very straightforward, very simple, um, very easy to do, did not take a lot of time. Um, we had, I, I did all the paperwork and then had a separate file for the time that would, when we would need that so that I was prepared as to then the steps I would have to take at Bob's passing. And when he was placed in hospice, I notified the hospice people, I notified the staff of the facility where he was, and certainly the funeral director um, about what we had wished to have happen. And all of those people combined, and I have to say the funeral director played a very large part in that, in making this seamless. Everyone did. It was just a very seamless process and experience. And they just came, I had the paperwork, I had um, duplicate, the paper I duplicated so that I was ready to give it to those people at this particular time. And they all had it. I notified the funeral director that I would be needing his services. We would be soon. And I met with him and gave him the paperwork. And he assured me that he had done this many times. He actually knew the staff at Penn. And it was just, a, it was again, seamless and easy being prepared for this moment. Because when the moment comes, um, you want to be prepared because you're not necessarily going to be in the mindset to be able to handle that then. Yeah, but that's was, a great point. It was a very easy process. And once you received the uh, neuropathologic uh, report, how did you, did you look at it and were you like, what, what does this actually mean? Um, can you talk a little bit about after you had the neuropathologic report, did you speak with um, one of the providers? And if so, how did that report help you to understand Bob's disease? It clarified what we'd all been seeing and what we thought. Um, it was extremely important to me. It was part of this journey, um, knowing for sure, you know, you can guess and you can think and and what if, what if this, what if that? And just seeing it um, was extremely um, freeing in a way. Um, speaking with the physician afterwards um, was just so helpful. Uh, it was as if he had all the time in the world to speak to me, answer any questions. And it's, in preparation for this, I went back into my file and I reread it. And it's interesting that now, a year and a half later, I saw something even something different that I know I read then, but made more sense to me now at this particular time. Um, so that part of the process was also, it was very meaningful. It, it added a great deal of meaning. And I, I know that Tish, I mean, it was Tish talked about it, this, and she used the word gift. And Bob and I really thought about this as a gift, yeah, it's a donation, but it's different than the, no, the, no, the donation that you make, say to the Red Cross or to some other organization. This is a gift, a part of someone that you've loved dearly for a period of time in your life. And being able to give this back and help the people that have so wonderfully and generously helped you through this process was very, very meaningful. And I know it was to Bob, even before the fact, it was a way to um, say thank you. And it was also in a funny way, um, it brought peace to me. I can't tell you how, explain that um, in depth right now, but the 
it just was very it was validating and it, it gave a lot of a lot of peace and closure to the whole process thank you sandy um thank you so much for your willingness to share your story with us today um it's just it's so impactful to hear uh, about the your firsthand experience um, with the brain donation process so thank you um i think i'm going to we're going to turn it back over to shana now okay Thank you both so much for your insights and thank you, Sandy and your family for making that uh, brain donation to science. Um, we're running short on time, so unfortunately we're unable to address questions during the live portion of this webinar, but know that you can always contact the AFTD helpline, call 866-507-7222 or email info at the AFTD.org to connect with a trained professional who can help answer any question you have. Thanks to everyone who has presented today. We've reached the end of today's webinar. To everyone watching, we hope you found our presentation to be informative. As a reminder, this webinar has been recorded. You will be able to find it on both the AFTD and the FTD Disorder, Disorders Registry's websites and YouTube channels in the coming days. Please let us know if you have any comments or questions about today's presentation. If you have any further questions about FTD, you can contact AFTD's helpline using the information on the left side of your screen. And be sure to sign up for the FTD Disorders Registry if you haven't already. Visit ftdregistry.org to learn more. Thank you.